Hello everybody, my name is Liam Walken and today we will be showing you how to go about removing a standard shower like this one here and replacing it with a much better option. This is a curbless shower which allows for very easy entry into the shower. It looks amazing and it has a lot less maintenance than your typical shower. A traditional shower will have a curb like this one here, which can be up to six inches in width, four inches or even more in height, and just kind of provides an unsightly barrier to get into your shower space. So let's talk about the alternative option. Now of course with every project we have to begin with demolition. So here we're just going to start tearing things apart. Now I do have a very detailed video on this exact subject if you're interested in learning about the exact specifics for demoing a shower or bathroom just like this one. And I do just want to touch on that. If you're planning on building a curbless shower, I would strongly encourage you to be renovating the entire bathroom, not just the shower. If you attempt to just renovate the shower for a curbless application, it's going to end up looking cheap and it's not going to be an easy process. You're better off waiting in case money is a factor here until you can afford the full renovation and go for it. While it is possible to just renovate the shower, it's going to be extremely difficult to make it feel like one coherent piece, and it's just not the best way to go about it in my opinion. Now when we talk about demolition here with a corner shower like this, you can see we have that pillar. So we're just going to use the sawzall to cut it out and then use leverage to remove it, and any larger chunks of tile will make use of the hammer and pry bar to kind of separate them from the backing board that they're attached to and just pull them off in nice big chunks. It's really important to wear your necessary protection while doing this. A respirator is always good, safety glasses, gloves, boots, all that fun and good stuff. Now in this shower here you can see there is a center light so we're going to go ahead and remove that. However the wire that was feeding it was still good. In our case it was nice grounded modern Romex so we can use that for a recessed light that we're going to retrofit in the future of this renovation. I do also want to note, of course, since we did remove some plumbing, we have water off in the house, of course, but again, if you want to learn more, check out the full demo video. Now, with every renovation comes some unexpected surprises, and in this one, that surprise was ants. Really wasn't something I had expected to see, but we did find them, so just, you know, as you're doing this, you might find a nice little surprise, and there's just always extra fun stuff to deal with. With this top piece here, much like the floor, which we're going to create a nice seamless look, we want our ceiling to be seamless in just one piece. So removing those top plates, oftentimes uh, the framers shot what seems like thousands of nails into one 2x4, so they're a bit of a pain to get out, I won't lie. Um, but with a sawzall and uh, a pry bar, you can get them out. You might just have to cut them up into smaller pieces and start prying away the fasteners. Um, and of course, if you're somewhere like I am where you've blown in insulation above, it can get rather messy. Now with the demolition complete, we can start planning out the shower. Now before we do this, even before the renovation starts, you might consider drawing up some plans. This here is a program called SketchUp, which I like to use to create 3D models of all of our projects. That way I can kind of come up with a rough layout, send it over to my clients, and we can figure out what works for them. In this case, you can see we have dimensions for everything. So now I know the size of the shower we'll be building. And when the renovation starts, I can easily draw this out on the floor with this straight edge here, and this is going to mark my shower pan location. Once we have that space defined, we can start to open up the subfloor. And to do this, we're going to use a combination of the skill saw and sawzall. For the open cuts, that's the left and bottom cut, we'll be using the skill saw set at the depth of the subfloor, which would be three quarters inch in most cases. We're just going to go ahead and rip all those lines. Now, the reason for doing this is as follows. When we talked about a curbless shower, we need the height of the shower to be the same as the height of the bathroom floor. However, for a shower to work, we need slope. So what you see there is the Curdy shower pan by Schluter. It is a foam pan that is waterproofed on the top, and it has adequate slope towards the drain. However, in order to pull off that slope, the perimeter of the pan has to be thicker than where the drain is. So in this case, you can see that the pan in question is an inch and an eighth inch thick. So how do we get the heights to match? Well, by recessing the subfloor in the shower area, that's essentially what we're going to be putting the subfloor and we're just going to be pushing it down the thickness of the subfloor, in our case, three quarters of an inch, that begins getting our heights to be the same. However, as you can also see, we're not quite there. So the next step that we're using in this video is going to be putting down an additional layer of plywood. For our pan and the height variance, 
we're putting down a quarter inch layer of plywood on top of our existing subfloor. And then you'll see there's still a slight gap. So in this case, we'll be using Schluter's Ditra Heat Peel and Stick Membrane. And this is a quarter inch thick. So by the time we put this on top of all the plywood, you'll notice that the top of the Dietra heat is either flush or even slightly above that shower pan, which is really what we're going for. Another benefit here is that this is an uncoupling membrane, meaning that we can eventually install our floor tile on top of the orange piece on the left there. And it's gonna help mitigate any uh, expansion and contraction in the floor and prolong give our, our new tiled floor the longevity and adequate backing it needs. So with that sort of demonstration, hopefully this is making a little bit of sense here. So taking the skill saw and going around the perimeter now, and then with the sawzall, we just have a wood blade on it. And we're just gonna go along the bottom plates of the two walls here to cut out a nice rectangle. When you're doing this, you do wanna cut just shallow. Uh, you don't wanna go too deep with the sawzall and cut any mechanical items below the floor that would not be good. And then something else you can do is make a few more rips with the skill saw if you want, just help break up the subfloor. And that way you can use a pry bar and get it up in smaller chunks. Uh, where the drain's connected, we're just gonna take a sawzall once again, cutting that, and eventually we can rework that drain. But for right now, we just wanna open this all up. Now with the size we have here, this will be our actual shower size. However, in order to properly recess the subfloor, we do need to open up the subfloor a little bit more on the left to the next closest joist. And we're going to show you how we're going to go about uh, fixing this later on. But for right now, it's important that we just open up the whole space all the way to that joist. Now with this shower, the clients did want a couple of niches. And of course, with a shower, you need a water supply. And with the right wall there being an exterior wall, we want to avoid running any plumbing or niches in that wall when possible. So that means that this one back wall is going to have to house everything. So we're going to have to rework a whole bunch. Uh, as you could have seen, we had an existing vent in this wall. So we're just going to go ahead and cut those for the time being. Disconnect the wires from the outlet that was existing. And then we can rework the two studs here. Again, because we are housing two niches there we ran horizontal, we do want to space these studs apart in order to fit those niches in. So in this video specifically, we went with two 28 inch long niches, which means we need a rough framing opening of about 31 inches. So we're just gonna move these over to space them that much. You can see a couple furring strips just on the back of that drywall there. This wall was furred out to house that plumbing stack on the left. Um, it's not really of any note, as long as with our new uh, framing that we're putting in here, we just wanna make sure everything is all flush. And then once those two two by fours have been moved, we can rework the vent here. That's kind of priority number one. You know, if there's an order of operations here, it's kind of you, your, your vent and drains have to go where they have to go. You kind of work your water lines around that. And then the electrical is a lot easier to manage. So when it comes to mechanical items like that, there is sort of that order to follow, generally speaking. Now I love symmetry and in order to have the easiest install and the best look, we want to get this drain to the center of our new shower area. So I'm just going to drill a hole there and you want to try to keep the holes in the center of the joist and keep them uh, the diameter of that circle less than one third of the joist. And then we can rework our drain to get to the center of this new space. And use those long sweep 90s as this is a horizontal drain and then I can kind of get my trap there and just make sure it's level there. It's going to make for the easiest install later on with the curdy drain. I do have to install backing for all of the shower controls. So this one will be for the valve. I'm just going to mount a two by six. And, and generally speaking with most shower valves, if you rough them in so that if you have a two by four cavity, if you rough a two by four, so that's sitting flush against the uh, drywall on the other side there, typically that's going to give you the right depth for your shower valve, but be sure to check because every valve is different. It might not be the case, but anyways, I'm going to put in kind of the valve there uh, with all the PEX adapters on it. And then I can start to mount another piece of backing on the right there for my handheld later on. And the clients did want a ceiling mounted rain head, which means we do have to get a piece of blocking up there for our drop ear, which is to me the connection for the rain head pretty much. So I have to cut open the vapor bearer, get that blocking up there, fasten it in, and then I have to create sort of a tent around it, if you will. So I'm going to repair my vapor barrier so that it's above the blocking. That way, all of the heat from the bathroom, the climate controlled air can make sure that that water line that's feeding the rain head doesn't freeze and is protected from the cold of the attic above via the insulation that's kind of forming a tent around it over that vapor barrier. 
and then I can run my PEX line through this space. And we are using PEX A in this video. If you are doing this yourself, you know, PEX B with the crimp style fittings are probably going to be the easiest, most accessible method. However, we have now switched the expansion type fittings. If you want to learn more, you're going to have to watch some dedicated videos on this subject. But what we're doing here is we start off by just running that water line up to the shower head and then the one on the right here is going to go to our handheld and we are running this in a very tight little spacing here because we're going to have a niche right above this and right below it so again a lot going on in this wall hopefully you're not having as much going on here because it is a little cramped hard to work with um, but you know we've done a lot of these so it, it is possible of course uh, and two niches of course eating up a lot of this wall space here now, when it comes time to recessing your subfloor, which as we discussed earlier, the methodology behind it, trying to get that floor height to be flush with the shower pan height, we're going to start by just taking a spare piece of our subfloor, most likely three quarter inch sub, uh, plywood in your case. We're just going to take a small piece of that, hold the top so that it's flush with the adjacent joist, and then take a pencil and just mark the underside of it on a few different places along our joist. And this is going to help speed up the install as we're doing this. Now, I would recommend having two people for this. You don't need two people. We've definitely done it with just one before, but it does make it a lot easier. What we've done is we've cut some two by fours to be about the length of our shower pan here. And we're going to put construction adhesive along it. And then we're just going to hold it tightly up against that joist. And we're going to have it so the top of that two by four is roughly at those pencil lines we marked up. We're using a framing nailer here and we're going to drive a nail into either side and then go back with our test piece of plywood and then feel so that the top is flush with that joist. If it's a little bit too high, as you can see, we kind of just take the hammer and just micro adjust that two by four. These are nails, so they will give a little bit when it's just the two of them. Now, we kind of purposely do put our two by fours just a little high because we have found that by having the framing nailer, we are able to get away with just taking the hammer after and just adjusting it down till it's flush. With that being said, you don't need a framing nailer to do this. You can absolutely use construction screws. Just make sure you're still using construction adhesive for the best results. And you're going to hold that two by four in place, screw it in. And then of course, with screws, uh, you wouldn't want to hammer down the two by four. Uh, so you would just want to make sure that as you're screwing them in, the two by four is at the exact height you need it to be at. And again, this is where having two people does come in handy. Uh, however, if you are just alone, having a couple clamps can also speed up the process and, and get you more exact results too. Now in a couple places, you'll know maybe we have water lines or maybe there's a drain or something else in the way. So you can just notch your two by fours as needed. In our case, we just took the sawzall there created a little notch and hammered out a couple of those chunks of the two by four to make room for the, the water lines that we had ran. And of course, once we have it the right height, you're just going to go back and drive a whole ton of fasteners into that two by four. We want it nice and strong as it will be supporting the, the floor. And as you can see with the height of this, um, we want it so that that plywood will fit underneath the existing floor. Uh, very snugly though, of course. And once you've done a couple, the rest should be fairly straightforward. You're just going to rinse and repeat. You're going to take your 2x4s, your construction adhesive, fasten them into position, make sure that the height is all correct, and then you will see us putting new strips of plywood in. We do cut these all in advance. We just measure, uh, create a cut list for the, the, the size of the plywood going into these joist spaces, and then that way as we're working here, backing ourselves into a corner, we can just dry fit these pieces in and have something to stand on as we're getting into those last couple rows. We do have a couple pieces of blocking here, so we do have to cut those out of the way. If you really wanted to strengthen this back up, you could either reuse the same pieces or cut some new ones, uh, kind of lay them flat down there and then screw those joists together um, through that piece of blocking. And as you're doing this, just be very careful. You know, you do have the subfloor open. You don't want to put your foot through that ceiling below, so just work with caution, take your time, and this process shouldn't be too bad. With everything fastened in, the dry fit has gone ahead and worked. We can now install the new subfloor here. So we're going to take some more construction adhesive, apply it along top of these sister 2x4s, and then we can simply take our new plywood strips and put them into position. 
we're gonna put a little bit of construction adhesive on that end there reason being is we cut these strips so they're about three inches longer than the opening that way we can kind of put them in an angle slide them underneath that existing subfloor and then once it's flat slide it back towards that wall there and get it underneath the bottom plate of the existing wall as well and then we can go back with flooring screws uh, every two to three inches drive in a screw and we're going to have a really strong floor this way and again the rest should be very straightforward once you've done the first one it's all the same pretty much uh, the only exception would be that row that has the drain in it you're going to want to mark out your drain location Typically, we'll just kind of mark it on the closest joist and then write how far over. Uh, so, you know, say that drains three inches from the edge of that joist. We'll just write that down on top of that joist. So later on, we can cut out a hole. If you have one that's too snug, like this one here, you can just mount a little piece of blocking, screw it in, and then hammer it on over to make sure you get that underneath that wall there. And once we have all the floor recessed, we can go and with this piece here, we just took a measurement from that wall on the right over 48 inches, which is our desired shower size. And then we can cut a piece of plywood uh, to adequately fill in that gap, if you will. And this way, now we have our correct recessed shower space. This is footage from a prior project, but now would be a great opportunity to drive some more fasteners into your existing subfloor. What we like to do is mark out our joist with a chalk line and then just go every three to four inches with a flooring screw just to ensure there's no squeaking with all our hard work done. The next step as we had shown earlier is to build up the rest of the subfloor here. So in this case, we are using quarter inch plywood. I like Sureply, it comes with these very handy little X's here which we're just gonna apply crown staples into every single X as well as construction adhesive. Now the manufacturers don't call for construction adhesive, but we just wanna make sure that the guy coming in after us has a miserable time. We're also gonna put in some expansion joints. So we're gonna put a quarter inch of space between each of these sheets and then also the same gap between the sheets of plywood and the walls. Now, while we're not doing it in this video, there is another way to go about doing a Kerbal shower without having to build up the floor like we're doing here, and that would involve shaving down the existing joists in the shower stall area. In this project, we couldn't get away with that. We had 2 by 8 framing that was spaced pretty far apart. There's a whole sort of equation you'd have to look into where you have to figure out the size of your joists, the span of your joists, the spacing of them. In order to see if they're oversized or not and to see if you can get away with shaving them down but by shaving down the top of the joist you would be of course reducing their height and then when you go to recess your subfloor uh, you could potentially get rid of that extra half inch that we're now building up the rest of the floor but again it's kind of a rare occurrence at least in our area typically the joists are specced to the like absolute bare minimum that they have to be uh, so it's not too often we get to shave down the joists and of course, there is kind of a whole structural concern uh, if you're shaving them down when you shouldn't be. Once you have all your sure ply in though, or whatever subfloor uh, or plywood you may have used, we can start boarding things up now at this point in the project. Uh, so green board everywhere. The ceiling, however, just getting regular drywall. Green board supposedly a little more prone to sag. Uh, if you drove enough drywall screws in, I would imagine you never have a problem. But just to be safe, regular drywall on the ceiling. Uh, we're just going to screw that into position here and kind of close everything up now. Now, a crucial step of building a shower is waterproofing. So tile, grout, it's not actual waterproofing uh, means. Eventually, water will find its way underneath. And when that happens, we want to ensure that the water stays contained. So what we're doing here is we're using Schluter Curdy Board, which is a fantastic beginner-friendly system in order to do this. These boards are made of foam with a waterproof layer on top of them and they come you can buy these washers uh, in order to fasten them to the framing and it's just a really nice system. The boards are lightweight, they're easy to cut, however they are expensive. But in my opinion, I think for the price point it is great value, especially if you're a beginner and it, you don't necessarily have to use the Schluter boards. There's a variety of different foam boards on the market. I'm a little more limited here in Canada. We don't have some of the options those of you in the U.S. might have, but foam boards are just the best way, in my opinion, of waterproofing a shower. 
So we just cut these with a knife primarily and then fasten them in. And that's kind of it for boarding things up. Now, something to note with the floor here, there's a couple little spots in this shower where we had some high spots in those joists. So I just took a planer and just to shave it down, honestly, in some places, just a 30 second of an inch. Uh, again, you want to try to avoid this, um, especially if your joists are not spec to it. With that being said, I have no issue taking off just small little variations of unevenness in these joists in order to get a flat subfloor. You can just use the orbital sander for any of those tight edges there. And was this step necessary? Not necessarily. We did have a very flat floor to begin with, but we have the tools and we want to make sure we're doing a perfect job here. So we can just kind of clean up those joists or any high spots when necessary. And then for the drain here, using a five inch hole saw. And if you go out and buy yourself a hole saw for this purpose, it's going to be very sharp. Drilling through plywood with a five inch hole saw can be very dangerous. I would suggest running your drill in reverse. That's right. Drilling your hole with the drill in reverse. If you try running it in forward, it's going to catch. You could really hurt your wrists. Just a word of caution. So this here is the Curdy shower pan we'll be using. It's our means of waterproofing and our means of slope. Yes, this thing comes with the slope we need. So it does have to be cut to size. In terms of width, it is 48. However, this one came in 72 inches of length. So we're just going to trim down the edges of that to make it fit into our space here. Uh, in order to cut this using a skill saw, but it is just foam, you could even use a knife. With the ceiling repair, uh, often when you're tying into existing drywall, you're going to have some ugly joints. So here, just pre-filling the gap, uh, sheetrock 45, you know, you just mix it up with some water. It's going to harden really nicely and, and fast. That way, usually, we'll do our pre-filling. So get rid of this ugly gap here, and then we can tape it on later in the same day. It's a really nice process this way. And in order to tape this, because it is kind of a larger, uglier joint, Sebastian here going with the six inch in width fiber fuse tape. It's a great product. Uh, that being said, you can absolutely still just use a paper or a mesh tape for this. But uh, Sebastian really likes the fiber fuse for scenarios like this one here. This is the Curdy drain. We are using ABS. So we have the one that's for ABS. And our drain is only inch and a half. These come with a two inch by default. So we're just going to put this reducer piece in. It's going to take it from two inch to inch and a half. We can just go ahead and kind of get that prepped and ready now. I'm going to glue that in there and any excess we're just kind of get rid of as we're using the yellow cement here, which is a little bit unsightly. You know, if you look down into that drain and see it. So just want to keep it clean. Now with this, we can start installing our DITRA. And in order to do this, we are using the peel and stick membrane. So we need a really clean subfloor. We're going to take a damp sponge and a rag, just get rid of any debris and dust, let that water there evaporate. And then we can start cutting our membrane to size with just a knife. Once we do that, we can peel off the plastic backing, tamp it into the floor, and it's just a pressure activated adhesive. So it's really fast. If you're not doing a heated floor, or don't want to spend money on the peel and stick version of this product, uh, there is both DITRA, just regular, or DITRA XL. DITRA just being an eighth inch thick. Uh, so if that's the case, you'll have to use a thicker plywood most likely to get the uh, correct height for your floor. And you will have to use Thinset to adhere it down. You'd also get DITRA XL, which would still require Thinset to install it. And if you're looking at how to go about doing that process, you could definitely check out Schluter's video on how to install DITRA. It's a great uh, tutorial video they have there if you're interested in using these products specifically. And again, as I had mentioned, not only is this going to get us the height we need, it's also going to aid us with our waterproofing method and provide a suitable backing for the floor tile that will be going in. As your house expands and contracts, you want to ensure that that tile floor doesn't start cracking and this membrane allows uh, for that exact reason that that longevity allows for the movement. It's a nice product. And finally, after all of that, we can start the actual waterproofing. So this is Schluter's All Set. Guys, I'm not sponsored by Schluter. All right, I just, I just use their products, okay? Man, do I use a lot of their products though. Anyways, what we're doing here is we're just mixing this up in a bucket. You can see we have the shop back there with an attachment just to suck up any dust. You want to wear a mask if you're mixing this stuff up. Uh, it's not good to breathe in. But anyways, 
I'm going to mix up that all set to a fairly thin consistency, run on the thinner side for waterproofing means. When you're tiling it, you do want it thicker than, than otherwise, but uh, for the waterproofing, thinner will help you out with your coverage. So we're just going to mix that as per the, the specs on the back of the bag. And as that's kind of setting up, we can start to figure out our drain component here. So we have that kind of white collar piece there that's going to get us to the right height we need and we can kind of put our drain piece in we just want to measure the distance from that schluter drain down to the existing trap and then we're going to cut a piece of pipe to bridge the gap between those two pieces we can then kind of do a little bit of a dry fit ensure that the height all works out and once that is confirmed we can glue it into the trap down below and later on as we're waterproofing we're going to come back and glue the drain that i have on the right there into position and to get that banding into place here, this is uh, the Schluter Curdy Trowel. And with the Curdy membrane going over every seam, every screw hole, every corner, it has to be watertight, right? So we're taking that thin set, we're troweling it out with that designated trowel, and we're doing directional troweling. Typically, you want to try to keep that thin set, the trowel lines, perpendicular to the banding. That way, when you put your banding over top of that thin set, you can take a drywall knife, flatten it out, and those ridges of thin set will collapse onto each other, and all of that air has a chance to escape out of the sides of it. And this is going to really help you get a nice tight bond and get that 100% coverage that you're looking for. So we're just going to keep working our way over. There is a kind of pipe collar you can put for any stub outs there, like where we have the handheld connection. Uh, there is also sort of a collar piece for your shower mixing valve. They don't work with every mixing valve. Uh, this one did work though, so we went ahead and used it. And then again, you can kind of see me waterproofing over uh, the seam where two boards meet and all of the screw holes where those washers were put into place. And then even where the curdy board ends and meets the uh, drywall there, we can go ahead and put some banding over that seam as well. We just want to try to make sure that our tile will eventually cover that. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't, uh, you know, you don't have to waterproof outside of the tile. But if you did, you can kind of get away with mudding over it. But ideally, just have your waterproof end kind of where the tile is going to end. And with the walls all waterproof, we can now move on to the shower pan. Um, this was a lot of prep, a lot it took to kind of get to this stage, but we're going to start by just kind of wetting that subfloor there. That way it doesn't pull all the moisture out of the thin set as it's setting up. We're going to use a quarter inch square notch trowel and directional troweling once again. We're going to get that drain piece in, right? So you saw we got that white foam piece spacer down, covered in thin set, glued our drain and then pushed it all into place. And then again, put the pan in place and you can see us doing the shuffle over top to tamp it down, get all that air out, collapse those ridges. You could put cover of cardboard if you wanted to. Uh, aid on the side of caution, right? You don't want to dent the pan. If you have a nail in your shoe or something, you don't want that to pierce the waterproofing. Um, but in our case, anyways, we tamped it down and then we can start waterproofing all of the corners once again. And you will notice that we're extending our waterproof good 16, at least 18 inches past the actual shower pan. This way, you got to remember with a curbless shower, water will eventually find its way beneath the tile and water can wick, right? Even though there's slope, it's not impossible for the water to start wicking out of side of the shower pan. In the event that some amount of water does find its way underneath the tile and outside of the shower, uh, we do have additional waterproofing. It will all still be contained within our waterproofing system. Think of it just it's kind of like a, you know, a backup policy, a little bit of extra insurance. And then where that drain is, again, it will your pan will come with a collar piece, that circular donut of membrane, which you can just apply around where the pan meets the drain, get that embedded nicely. And then we also want to waterproof where the shower pan meets the Dietra, that, that orange uncoupling membrane we had put down, which again, one of the great benefits of it is that it is waterproof. So extending the waterproofing from not only our shower, but to the rest of the bathroom floor becomes very easy with this system. And one of the reasons why I like and use it so often. And then the next day, while our waterproofing has had a chance to set up, we can start tiling and we're going to start with the floors. Now, I am a huge believer in large format tile on shower floors, small tile, mosaics, a lot of grout, a lot of maintenance, 
uh, a lot of disgustingness to come. So I just believe in avoiding that altogether and using these large tiles. Only problem, of course, is when we think of a shower pan, there are four slopes of four planes of slope going down to that drain. So in order to make these tiles that span multiple planes work, we have to add these diagonal relief cuts. It's going to kind of go from where that drain is. You can see I marked the drain out in the center. And then I drew with a straight edge, a pencil line from that drain corner to the uh, corner of the shower pan. And what we're going to do is we're going to number each and every one of these pieces. I can cut them on the wet saw, cut a long top of that pencil line. And this way, we've now created what's called an envelope cut. This is the relief cuts that are necessary for this large format tile to have the correct slope in the shower pan. And we number them that way when you come back with your puzzle pieces it's not actually a puzzle figuring out where they go you just kind of write one two three four in the way you would read a book perhaps and just start putting them back into place dry fitting them ensuring that everything worked out if you need to make any adjustments it's a lot easier to make those adjustments before you have them covered in thin set now, I won't lie, an envelope cut is a tricky thing to pull off. If you're not confident enough in doing that, you can absolutely use mosaics. There's nothing wrong with mosaics, but I would strongly encourage you to maybe look at using a product like Spectralock 1 or an epoxy grout, something that's going to hold up well over time. Because with mosaics in showers, if you just use a regular grout, you better be cleaning them fairly regularly and resealing them every couple of years. Otherwise, they will get gross, I promise you. Now, in order to install these tiles, we just took a half inch square notch trowel, applied our thin set. For this, we're using MAPE Carabon T. It's a go to thin set for large format tiles over any of the Schluter products. We're using that directional troweling. And to space it, we're using this 1 16th wedge style system. So that comes with those orange wedges that's going to reduce the amount of lippage between tiles. And I say reduce because I get a lot of questions about this. These wedges and clips aren't magic. They're not going to pull your tiles up to be completely flat with each other. They're not going to throw your slope off from one plane to the other. They just make little micro adjustments. So any small amounts of lippage you have between tiles, the wedges are going to help to reduce that. Now, you should still have a level handy, just a little torpedo. And as you're laying out these tiles, checking for that slope. Uh, but with that being said, no, the wedges aren't going to throw off your slope. Don't worry about that. We do like 1 16th grout lines. It's just less grout, in my opinion, is kind of the better. Uh, with that being said, 1 16th, like the smaller the grout line you go, the, the harder it does get. So if you're an absolute beginner, you might consider doing 1 8th inch thick grout lines, but that's kind of up to you. With each and every piece we install, we are back buttering it, meaning Sebastian is kind of handing me these pieces that already have thin set on the back of them. He's just taking the flat edge of a trowel to do that. That way, thin set loves to stick to thin set. It makes sure that we're going to have good coverage. I'm not putting a single wedge in until I have the entire shower pan kind of in place. Uh, reason being, again, these envelope cuts can be tricky. It can be tough getting all these grout lines to flow perfectly. So by waiting to put the wedges in until they're all in, uh, this kind of allows me to make any little bits of uh, adjustments that I need. And once they're all in, I can make sure everything's good and then lock them all into place make sure all of the lippage is gone i do also get some questions about you know is this too slippy can you use large format tile in a shower and you can you absolutely can you just got to make sure it's not a glossy style you want a matte tile or a home tile of some kind and on top of that if you're really worried you can look up the tiles cof it's just a rating it has it pretty much tells you how slippy it is okay uh so you want to maintain um you know, a certain COF within shower floors. Um, so you can definitely look that up. But honestly, my, my advice has always been just to feel the tile, right? When you're picking it out, feel the tile. Does it feel slippy? No. Okay, it's probably good. But again, if you're really paranoid, you can look up that COF. And one more recommendation I might make here is, again, if you're kind of doing this yourself and you're a beginner, it can be a lot of tiling to do an envelope cut and a bathroom floor in one day. But with that being said, I do think you're better off doing it this way by doing both the envelope cut and the rest of the bathroom floor in the same day, you're going to be better able to correct any minor amounts of lippage. Um, say if you kind of set the envelope cut and then came back the next day to put in the rest of the tiles. Well, at that point now, your tiles in the envelope cut, 
they're set they're cured you can't move them at all not to be said like as you're tiling once a tile's set you don't really want to touch it too much after you know say 10 15 minutes of it being set you want that thin set to cure on its own you don't want to break any sort of bond that's happening but having it curing and doing this and having the freedom of slight micro adjustments will make for a cleaner install in my opinion if you're not doing an envelope cut say you're doing a curbless shower install and you're doing maybe a mosaic in the shower floor something we like to do sometimes is we'll actually tile the rest of the bathroom floor kind of leaving just the shower area untiled that way it's actually quite easy to tile with the mosaics in that perfectly squared shower area with the large format tiles because you can just kind of drop the mosaic sheets into place it makes for an easy install so just something to consider i think if you're doing that envelope cut you want to try to get this all done in the same day if you're doing a mosaic you can kind of get away with doing the mosaic after the rest of the bathroom floor and once again the next day once the tiles have uh, had a chance to set up we can go ahead and remove all of these wedges just kind of kicking them out of place and also at this time if you have any thin set that was kind of hardened in between your your grout lines there you can take a sharp utility knife and just kind of scrape it away very gently you don't want to extend your knife too deep you don't want to pierce that waterproofing below but you do have to make sure there's enough room for grout to set into that grout joint and of course, we then want to cover our beautiful new floor as we're going to still be doing quite a bit of work in here. So just taking some paper, some, some blue painter's tape and adhering it all down. And with that, we can start tiling the walls of the shower. And you'll notice a laser line in that you're going to need this, okay? There's no getting around it. If, if you're planning on doing this project yourself, you need a laser level. Uh, and what we're doing here is we kind of have that set up at the 12 inch line reason being this is an eight foot ceiling showers are 24 by 24 but that's not an actual 24 inches it's a little bit shy so if we just started with the full tile we'd end with a sliver cut at the top so instead we're going to start with the half tile and end with the half tile it's going to be the cleanest look you can see what i just did there is i kind of set the tile up in the direction it wanted to be and then flipped it upside down that way i can mark the laser line with a pencil on the back here and right on either side on on both points of that laser i'm then going to flip it back over transfer those lines to the front of the tile and then i can make my cut on the wet saw using those two pencil lines as a start and end point reason why we flip it like that is this way your cut line will be against the floor right we want that nice factory edge of tile um, on the top where it's going to be visible the one on the floor we're going to eventually uh, have a silicone joint there that's going to hide any sort of ugliness you might have with your cut. Uh, sometimes as you're cutting porcelain tile, you'll have these little microchips. You could polish them out, but the cleanest edge is always going to be a factory edge. Now for install here, we're actually back buttering the wall and troweling out the thin set on the back of the tile. This is just kind of something I found to be cleaner for me, something a little bit faster for myself. When tiling walls with large format tiles specifically, you can absolutely trowel the thin set out on the wall and back butter your tiles. Whatever works, okay? Whatever works for you. Now you will also, if you, if you kind of look at the bottom row of tile there, we have these tiny little plastic red wedges and those are really useful for ensuring that those tiles there, that the top of them is perfectly in line with that laser level. This is, after all, a 24-inch rectified porcelain tile. Rectified meaning that at the factory they get cut so that they have that really clean factory edge there and they're all the same size, or in theory all the same size. When you're working with these tiles especially, you really, really need those uh, that, that first row to be perfect. Um, as you work your way up, otherwise any imperfection will continue to grow and it's going to be hard to work with, especially when you're working with a square tile like this, because when we have that four-way intersection with the grout line, we need that to be consistent the entire way and also transfer over to that next wall as well. And once that wall on the right has been completed, that now gives us our established grout lines. So what we can do with that is create the niche cutouts. When we do niches here, I really like to have either the top or bottom of the niche, or if you're using an appropriate size tile, both of those uh, kind of border lines with the niche have the grout line running through them. It provides for a really clean look for either the top or bottom of your niche to have that full tile there. Uh, it just creates a really beautiful flow, uh, in my opinion. So what we've done is we've kind of just ran the laser through that grout line on the right there, and we can take that, bring it over to this wall here, and put up our niche against it and cut out the niche for where it needs to go. 
Now with these niches, we will be doing mitered edges. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of an advanced technique for this stuff. Uh, if you're a beginner, you're probably not going to want to do this, although you can certainly try. And I do have a full video on this topic if it's something you want to learn how to do. But as you can also see with these niches, uh, we do tile the back of them prior to this. So say when we're doing the floor, we finish up, we have a little extra thin set left over. We'll just go ahead at that point and just put in kind of this little mosaic accent tile we had into the backs of these niches. And that's just one less thing we have to do, you know, today or, or whenever we're installing the niches. These niches will also come with some accent lighting, which I don't yet have a video out on, but I'm working on it. We'll get that one out in case that's something you want to add to your project. It's a really cool way just to add a little bit of accent lighting and enhance the overall feel of your space. But with these cutouts now open, we can put in a little bit of wood blocking uh, along the tops and bottoms of these two cutouts. That way, when we go to insert a niche, we can screw around the entire perimeter of it and it's really going to help tighten things up and get those niches set into place. And then the last step with this process, just kind of waterproofing that entire seam now. So just taking the curdy band and the thin set and just going over the entire perimeter. Just like with the previous wall, we're going to take that laser line and run it through the now established grout line over there and then take all our measurements from the floor to this laser line as you saw previously get our cuts done, and then just work our way up this wall. We want to make sure that these tiles are corresponding with the floor grout lines. So you can see that painter's tape just revealing those grout lines just a little bit. That way we can line them all up. And then once we have all our cuts, we can just kind of start working our way up. We do ideally want to leave a small gap between the corner tiles, right? For expansion and contraction reasons. We want to eventually fill that corner up with silicone. So just a small little line there, 1 16th, 1 8th would be ideal. Anytime we have a cutout like this one here, we have an L cut. I'm just going to hold the tile up, kind of mark with a Sharpie or a pencil where I need to make my cuts. I'll go out, make that L cut, and then come back and put it in. And hopefully with your project, you know, you don't have guts that are as busy as this wall, for example. You know, this wall, we had all the shower controls, we have the two niches, so a tile like this one, for example, we got to cut out the two niches for it. We have to miter all those edges, and we have to cut out the shower valve, that shower handheld over there, perhaps cut the length to make sure it fits appropriately. Ideally, you don't have this many cuts going on with your tile, but this is one of those things you run into more often when you're using a large format tile. It does make, for my opinion, an easier install overall, but sometimes you'll have a cut or a piece of tile that you have to cut multiple times, and it could take you 10, 20 minutes just for a single tile. You run into these things on occasion. You just have to have some patience when you're doing this type of work. And you will now see Sebastian kind of filling that end joint there with some fresh thin set. And then he's going to shove in this tile profile. This is the Schluter Deco SG profile. It's a half inch channel. And that's going to allow our glass panel eventually to just be seated into it and silicone in there. We do this not on every job, but sometimes it just works out better with this shower. For example, we have two full tiles on that back wall. We don't want a little sliver piece of tile so that our glass guys have something to adhere their tile into. So instead, we kind of kill two birds with one stone. We one get to cap off that tile edge with the profile, but two also provide a nice place for our glass to be installed into. And of course, we can finish off the niches here. If we weren't doing these miter niches, we would have just done them the previous day. But these style of uh, the style of finishing here, it does take a lot of extra work. You got to get those sharp bevels on your tile edge. You got to make sure everything sits right. And anytime I'm doing this, I just like to pack a whole ton of thin set in behind those tiles, kind of push them in until that thin set squeezes out got good coverage that way but more importantly i'm able to make sure that bottom row especially needs to have slope towards the drain i have to also ensure that all of my corners are nice and tight so that i have the best final looking results here and again i do have a full video on how to miter and epoxy tile corners if that's something you're interested in just keep in mind it is a little bit more of a tricky technique using tile profiles or threshold pieces stone pieces something like that is going to be a much easier install if you are just a beginner. Anytime you have a natural stone tile, like the back tiles here in the niche, a little mosaic, you do want to seal it prior to grouting, uh, just to help protect it as it is a porous tile. Uh, so in this case, that tile was sealed and then grouted, just using a light gray. 
can of course use white grout although it has some issues uh with longevity if you are using white i'd strongly recommend maybe an epoxy grout or a spectralock one something like that or just not using it in a wet area so anyways here we did opt for just a very light gray grout and i think it kind of meshed well with the surrounding gray tile anyways and then mixing up this epoxy here this is two part 10x part a part b uh the strong edge epoxy just kind of painters tape around those corners and then just fill those corners up remove the tape let it sit for about two hours and then i could kind of shape it with a very sharp knife and then the next day sand it to give it a nice rounded corner that way it's not sharp in any way and it's going to feel as if these tiles are wrapping around it's just a really really nice finish the grout color here is silver shadow laticrete permacolor grout uh, so with this grout, it does need to be sealed. So I'll show you the sealing process in a little bit here. If you're looking for what is truly the like maximum maintenance free shower, I suppose you would just have giant slabs or some of those newer shower systems you could try out. But if you want a actual like traditional porcelain tiled shower and you know, the slabs are crazy expensive and to get someone that can do them is also crazy expensive. So your other best bet is of course, what we've done here is just using a large format tile, small grout lines. And the next best thing you could do then, assuming that this is the case for you, is you would use an epoxy grout, right? Um, but again, that's going to be very costly, not only for the material, but for the installation price of that epoxy grout as well. And I honestly do believe, though, that if you are using a tile size like this with the 116th grout lines, you can absolutely get away. You know, you put a gray grout in there, seal it up, and I... I don't think you're going to be dealing with too much maintenance. Obviously, you'll still have maintenance. It's a bathroom. You're always going to have some level of maintenance. But with these methods that we've kind of put into place here, it's going to greatly reduce how much you have to do to keep this space looking nice and clean. And as far as the install goes, we use a grout float, put our grout in. By the time we've got through the whole bathroom, elapsed time, maybe 20 minutes, I'm going to go back for our first wash, just a very damp sponge. I see very damp. I mean, not damp at all. You want to be able to wring it out so there's basically no water coming out. You know, rub off any excess on the tile at a 45 degree angle to your grout line. And we wait another hour or so, come back with a microfiber and remove any leftover grout haze. Any corners, you should hopefully have avoided grouting. Uh, you want to leave a space for the silicone now. So this is a color match silicone. This is Lattice and Silver Shadow, just like the grout. We're just going to go over all of our corners, spray it with some soapy water, and then use a popsicle stick to remove it and give it a nice shape. It's going to clean up really nicely. Eventually, I will come out with a full video on grouting and silicone. Finally, the toys can start coming in. So we got our first step here with the rain head. And this just has a six inch kind of chrome nipple. So the one end going in, we're gonna apply Teflon and pipe dope and just thread it into the drop here in that ceiling there. It has this little escutcheon plate, kind of put up flush against that drywall, tighten it into place. And then the rain head just screws over that. It has a kind of a black gasket in it. So we don't have to use any Teflon of any sort. Although sometimes you will, depending on your shower head. And this here is the water connection for our hose going to the handheld. So it's just kind of like a female threaded port. So we're going to take a brass nipple and that's going to Teflon and pipe dope on either side. The one side, of course, will screw in to our kind of water connection here. The other side will screw into the wall connection and they make these nipples available in every half inch. So depending on the depth of which and what uh, brand you're using, you may have a different length. I think this shower and, and our installation called for a three inch nipple there maybe. But again, um, typically when I go, I just I just keep stock with like every size nipple from two inch to three and a half inch that way when we're doing this you just get the right appropriately sized one and put it in and then the shower valve here so this is uh it's our rio belt products which is a very nice brand uh you know it's 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 not a cheap brand right you're gonna have to spend some money but it is a very nice brand and getting this kind of uh valve in place now there's always a million parts to these uh valves uh, but it's kind of fun. You know, you get to play around with a whole bunch of cool looking machinery things. So I enjoyed this part. You do obviously want to be reading the instructions though with these. Uh, some of them, for example, will call for silicone. Some won't. This one, for example, had these black uh, gaskets. So as we tighten it, that compresses against the tile, creating a watertight seal. Even despite that, I did kind of still go with a small bead of silicone just to be extra safe. Um, and then you can put your faceplate on. Of course, you would want to test the water prior to kind of closing everything up and sure that you did everything right at this point. But yeah, I always love Chrome. Look at that finish there. 
And then with this handheld sprayer, so we did have the wood blocking during roughing that we put in just above our water connection there. So we can then put some painter's tape, use a laser to establish a straight line, drill a couple holes through that porcelain tile. And then with our handheld bar here, we can take some long four inch wood screws and drive it directly into that wood blocking behind. And that's gonna create a really, really strong handheld bar here. Lastly, so this was uh, two or three days after grouting, can't really remember, but uh, you do wanna allow your grout appropriate time to cure before sealing it. Uh, I think ours called for 48 hours. So we're just taking this little applicator tool, right? Just a little bottle with a brush on the end, running it through all the grout lines. And you wanna wipe off any excess sealer that got on your tiles. You don't want that sealer to set up on the tiles because you will be able to see it. So we're just gonna let that sink into that grout and then make sure it's not left over on the tile surface anywhere. It's always really nice when we get to turn on the shower fixtures. Uh, all your hard work has kind of paid off at this point. And you'll notice a flickering in the lights. That's just the, the a camera with the lights issue. Uh, you know, in person, they don't flicker. Maybe one day I'll learn how to use my camera properly. The last thing to go in, of course, is this glasswork. And as you can see, it's not us doing this. It's a third party. This here is Bola Glass, who I have been working with for quite some time now. Got Harpreet in the sweater. Nicest guy ever. Uh, it's always a pleasure having him out. He does all the measurements, and then they come in uh, with this 10 millimeter tempered glass, and they just put it in. And this was my first time seeing the install happen, and it was really cool to see uh, how these guys can maneuver these large, heavy pieces of the glass and get them to the kind of exact specs that we needed. So as you can see, they got this first piece in, a 4x8 fixed piece of glass, and they have these shims down on the floor just to keep it off of that floor as they kind of slide it into that deco profile there against the tile. They then shoot a laser level, and this is going to line up with the top and bottom of this fixed piece of glass and also be in line with the deco on that other tiled wall. This way they can just ensure that they have this piece perfectly level and exactly where they want it and use this air shim to make any little adjustments. And then they're going to stick these clear, hard plastic pieces below the glass on either side here. Just keep it off the floor until they can get the silicone in here. And they can remove these shims now and then kind of use these brackets, a uh, little pencil mark there to ensure they have it exactly where they want it, both on the ceiling and the floor for just this piece as it will be supporting the full weight of the door. Uh, so here drilling through that porcelain tile and there are ways to do this without piercing your waterproofing, of course. However, in this shower, we were okay with that little hole that is going to be filled up with silicone, as you can see. Just want to get a generous amount in there. And then they can get this anchor into place and then use a stainless screw to support this bracket to the floor. And this is going to add a ton of strength uh, to the glass and specifically uh, to that door. That, that glass door, it weighs a lot. So we need to ensure that it is well supported. Now, there are ways to do this install without having to drill through the floor. For example, you can check out previous videos where we have laid a deco profile in the floor so that the glass panel can just simply be inserted into that. However, I don't think that is a necessary step to take. I am perfectly comfortable with the install that you are seeing in this video here. With the two brackets now anchored in, the guys can reposition the fixed piece to be snug up against them and now fasten them into position and they're not going to fully fasten them at this point they're just going to snug it up to kind of hold it steady as they are going to have to make some small adjustments when they're putting in the other two pieces with this bottom one here as it is in sort of the wet area they're just going to apply a little bit of silicone uh, inside of this bracket and then once they tighten it they're going to remove any of the excess that does uh, kind of make its way out they can then cut these plastic pieces to be flush with the glass on either side, and they're going to do this for both uh, the one here and the one towards the wall. These are the corner brackets that are going to support the door. So in this installation, we will have the door hinged from this fixed piece you're seeing now, and it will pivot both in towards the shower and outside, so you can go either way with it. Uh, the logic behind this is so that you can kind of push the door into the shower, access your shower valve, simply turn it on, let the hot water come out, and let it warm up for a bit, and then uh, get into your shower. And then same thing, when you're leaving the shower, you can kind of open the glass uh, door towards you. Any water that is on that glass will have a chance to bead off into the shower area. And that way, the rest of the bathroom floor will remain dry. So they are just going to go ahead and snug up these corner brackets, uh, make sure they're square 
tighten them into place before getting the door in here. And similarly to the floor, they're going to get a couple of these hard plastic pieces in between the glass and that deco there just to keep it really snug until they can get the silicone in. You can see here they're going to lift the door into position. They put a shim down below it so that it's going to make it easier on them to install this piece. And in terms of our glass work, so the door itself is going to be about a foot shy of the ceiling in this install. That way all the humidity and steam from the shower has a chance to exit towards the exhaust fan that we positioned to be just outside of it. And this next fixed piece will be the last, of course, and it's going to be installed very similar to that first piece you saw. Uh, so they're just going to get it into position first, slide it into that deco profile, shim it up off of the floor, get those little plastic pieces underneath of it, and then they can start lining everything up. I do also want to note that with this glasswork here, we do have it DFI coated which is a product similar to how Rain-X works. When water gets on it, it will beat off. So we do get this coated on the interior of our glasswork. That way, it reduces the amount of maintenance. One of the problems with uh, glass in a shower, of course, is the maintenance, right? I mean, a lot of water, a lot of soap scum, dirt, grime, whatever. Showers need maintenance. That's just a thing. And we're trying to reduce how much maintenance they need. So by getting that coating, we still always, of course, recommending having a squeegee in there as well but it does greatly reduce the amount of maintenance you will need. With the door here for the handle, clients did opt for the towel bar handle, which is a really nice feature. You can kind of put your towel on the outside of the door here, take your shower, and when you're done, your towel is literally just right there. So it's a really cool feature. These handles do just get screwed in from the one side and there's kind of like a cap uh, or the other side of the handle that goes on the other side and that just has a little Allen key that's hidden uh, and it ends up looking really clean. They do clean the glass as they go. However, with the way that silicone works and with these custom glass enclosures, the silicone does need 48 hours to cure before you can really touch the glass. So once the silicone is cured 48 hours from now is really when the shower should get a, a nice cleanup from any of the smudges that were created during the install. And with the bottom of the door here, of course, there is that gap. So just getting this uh, gasket on here. And this is a snug fit. And you could also uh, run an additional one on the corner. You'll see there's just a slight gap between the door and that fixed piece. Uh, typically, we don't do this. It could be added later on at any point, really. Uh, we find it's just in most showers not necessary. While sure, it has a functional purpose, uh, there's also an aesthetic thing that we kind of have to think about with these showers. We avoid putting that piece in in the corner for this install. But again, it could be added later on. And then they're going to go ahead with the silicone. They're going to go ahead and apply beads on all of the fixed pieces. So where these pieces meet the floor on both sides and then where it slides into that deco channel. Want to get silicone into that channel as well. So they're going to lay these beads. They're going to use uh, a glass cleaner similar how when we install our silicone, we use soapy water. They're just going to use a spray so the silicone doesn't stick to any other surfaces once they've laid their beads. And then they can use a removal tool to shape that silicone, get rid of any excess, and have a really clean look. And once again, I'm going to put Bola Glass's information in the description below. So if you're located in the greater Toronto area and you're doing a bathroom, maybe I'm not within your area of service. Maybe you've chosen to do the shower yourself and uh, you just need someone to do the glass work for you. For whatever the reason may be, if you're not working with me specifically, uh, but you do need glass work, I would highly recommend these guys. So be sure to check them out. And in case you've forgotten what we had going into this project, here it is. And this is what we we're able to create from that. So in my opinion, just a much better use of the space by getting rid of those walls and opening things up with a custom glass enclosure, really able to have this shower feel a lot larger. And well, it is a lot larger. I am a huge fan of curbless showers. I think they're just far superior to a curb shower. However, they're a little bit more work. You have to really plan things out ahead of time. There's a few different factors you need to consider, which you may have noticed watching this video. But in saying that, I think it's well worth the extra effort. I love how we're able to create these nice showers here with the niches, gives you a ton of storage space. The large format tile shower on the floor, giving you a lot less maintenance than your typical mosaic flooring. Uh, the absolute seamless transition from the bathroom floor into that shower floor is something I just really love and appreciate. So it's always a pleasure getting to build these custom showers. I, I really enjoy it and I think they're just great. 
If you did enjoy this video, maybe you could hit that like button. It would really help me out. YouTube algorithm needs to do its thing. And if you want to see more of this type of content or maybe some other home related projects that might be coming up, uh, hit that subscribe button because we will be having a ton of content coming out in the near future. And if you're located in the Mississauga or surrounding areas and are looking to have a renovation like this done, our site will be in the description below. So you can submit a form request there and maybe we can work together one day. And in terms of cost, here you go. Keep in mind, I'm not in this line of work for my insane math abilities, so these figures are just rough. And this took about 10 days to do, and that's really nice to see. Uh, you know, not too long ago, this would have taken us 15 days. So to see how much we've both improved, Sebastian and I, we've gotten faster, been able to do better quality of work. It's really, really cool to, to see this happening in such a short period of time. And I have shared the labor charge, of course. Um, keep in mind, though, that this is my price. This is no other contractor's price. I know a lot of you find this to be cheap. Some of you find this to be expensive, and that's okay. Because it's my price. Uh, please, all I ask is do not hold another contractor to these numbers. That doesn't make sense. Especially when you're comparing across countries. Uh, I, I do want to one day make kind of an in-depth video going over how I price these things. Uh, sort of a more in-depth breakdown of this, so hopefully I can make that happen eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, just know I'm doing okay, guys. All right? Everything is good over here. Anyways, that is it for this one. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it provided a little more detail and insight onto how to create one of these curbless showers and overall bathroom projects. And other than that, I hope you guys have a fantastic day.